Uh, yeah, I think it's standard, standard on Skype now. Oh, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, cool. I think they added it last year. So um, we have a strange classroom set up here where there's no front of the room, oh, and, we, and yeah. we have screens all around with your face on it. So students might be facing away from you, but they're actually looking at you. So. Okay. Well, I think that's cool. Okay. <laughs> it's very, um, I don't know what, uh, there's no there there. Or something. Oh man, oh. I got to take a screenshot of that. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Remember how to do it. There we go. Oh yeah. Screenshot. Sweet. High tech. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, and uh, everyone's been reading your book here with great interest. Um, that's it. Cover to cover. Yeah, yeah, cover to cover. We just finished it. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure they have a lot of questions because they're trying to do the assignment. And, and especially at the end, um, you, you sort of say to be continued into electronic monuments, yeah. which they have not read. So. Um, but anyway, you said you had some prepared remarks, so do you want to begin with that? Yes, yes. Let's um, let us begin. And I want to thank you for inviting me, Barry, Professor Maurer. Um, Barry Stein. Are here, uh, University of Central Florida, and I'm present <laughs> yeah, virtually. I'm in Florida, so we're not that far away. Um, but this, this is fun because, um, I, I, first of all, I really like the fact that Barry is using internet invention and I hadn't realized at first it was with a, a graduate class. And so, uh, I hadn't intended to write a, a spiel, but in fact, you, I hope you get comfortable. I don't know how many hours you got today. <laughs> it's a three hour class, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Keep in mind that I'm retired, so yeah, you know I have a little more time. And <clears throat> but I wanted to talk to y'all as colleagues, um, and I understand that there's a couple questions Barry already sent me, just general questions, you know, policy formation question, the consulting question, which is definitely a legitimate issue with the book, um, and then uh, the wide image, how to how to assemble it. And I understand you've done all the exercises, um, which, I mean, that's really admirable. I, I didn't do them myself, so. so. But, but the exercises are there to uh, indicate that this is something you're supposed to do, not something you're supposed to just read about or, you know, understand, you're supposed to undergo it. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and lecture um, a little differently thinking about you as as colleagues and as research uh, having a research program so I'm going to talk to you about uh, the research background the research methodologies uh, that produced internet invention and really my whole research career my research program because you are forming your own research programs. Uh, and part of it is just uh, be, oh, my cat has just. But I hope he doesn't tromp over here. Um, and, you know, so, so you've committed to the humanities and that's admirable in itself. And, uh, you know, Internet invention begins, uh, I guess, in the preface with a little story about when I decided to become an English major. And my dad was a civil engineer uh, in his education. <clears throat> and all through, my, all through my education up through high school in Miles City, Montana, I didn't know that the humanities existed. No, they, didn't let, they didn't let on. Was it, I don't know if it was a secret, but um, so I got to the University of Montana and discovered there was this thing called 
humanities and is through gen ed, general education requirements. So <clears throat> 1964, <laughs> like 1964, I was a sophomore in college. Um, and <clears throat> went home and told my folks that I had, told my dad uh, that I had decided to major in English. And we were at a, a, a gathering there um, <clears throat> as my father and Mr. Richards, who was a rancher, a friend of his, and actually it was on the Board of Regents of the University System of Montana. Um, and, you know, uh, they said to me, and as I, as I recorded there, that, you know, now what real people did was they took some raw material and they transformed it into something useful. Um, so Mr. Richards, a rancher, he took cattle and turned it into beef. Well, my dad uh, owned a Santa gravel plant, made concrete products, so he took aggregate out of the pit, his gravel pit, and um, turned it into concrete products for building and other uses and, and uh, arts and letters disciplines were kind of parasites on that or maybe at best it's sort of the ants and the grasshoppers and we were you know humanities were the grasshoppers and I couldn't really eh, you know couldn't really didn't have too good a comeback to that so like eh, you know uh, but in grad school I, I actually came upon an answer you know like esprit de l'escalier your answer is a little too late but <clears throat> And that is this, this notion the Germans called Bildung, but it really goes back to the Academy, the Lyceum, Plato and Aristotle. And the idea is that education also takes raw material. Human beings um, are, have these capabilities, but the capabilities are only potential. Uh, they're dunamis, you know, they're, they're, um, they're in this state of privation and they have to be made actual in our gaia. And education is this process of actualizing these capabilities. And the capabilities, uh, also known as virtues, um, powers, uh, Aristotle identified them as uh, you know, the three intellectual virtues, and it's theoria, which is thinking or knowing, praxis, which is doing or willing, and poesis, which is making or imagining. And uh, so these are the three intellectual virtues. These are capabilities that we all are born with and then we develop through building. And, and recently I've been just, I, I kind of put these into a, a portmanteau word that I call theopraxesis. If I can plug my most recent book. And Barry, I don't know if you and I have talked about this concept. Uh yeah, yeah, you sent it to me. I I just started it. Oh, cool, yeah. So, what the heck? Theopraxis, you know. Like, yeah. And you know, not not just thinking, but theopraxis. Okay. So, <clears throat> so my story is a kind of a Bildungsroman, you know, in that sense of a tradition of of coming into ownership, uh, uh, actualizing your capabilities. <clears throat> and this is why also another another term. And you notice that I'm fond of generating terms, and I get a lot of crap about this, uh, but I think it's nothing compared to, you know, if you read these theorists and so forth that I'm referring to, these philosophers, they, they you know, they are much worse neopests, as I like to call them, than I am. But anyway, I like this idea of egant, because I was thinking about, all right, identity agency transforms in, in, in the electricity. Uh, so I was thinking, well, what's an, the E agent? Um, and then Egan, it turns out, you know, oh, I should have known. I mean, Egan turns out to be a verb in Latin. And you got to, this is part of our generative. This is the math for us where we see how language can generate um, ideas and, and thinking. So the Latin verb, it's a concept, um, uh, but egeo, egere, egui, uh, means need, lack, want, uh, requirement, uh, to being without. And there's this, uh, I found this passage uh, in the Bible in Latin. Um, I didn't find it, somebody found it for me, but you know, it's in the book of Romans. And uh, it says, Omnis enum pecca verunt et agent gloriam dei. And it translates as, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Egent is this 
falling short. And uh, it's this, uh, what, this is what happens to agency. In literacy, uh, we have this uh, mythology of our agency and you know, the individual self-subject will take charge of the situation, maybe get a gun, right man with a gun and go, you know, go fix things. Uh, that's agency, but that is not agency. And, and so we're trying to learn about uh, consulting from the point of view of agency, that is from electricity and not from literacy, or let's say what internet invention is about is a pedagogy of moving from uh, literacy to electricity. So, all right, so the title of this talk might be the making of internet invention, the making of internet invention, thinking about uh, how I produced it as research, and the idea of maybe is trying to recruit you a little bit to this project, because believe me, electricity needs to be invented and is far from uh, being invented. I mean, I'm, I'm suggesting a, a way into doing that, but uh, there's much, much work that needs to be done. And of course, this is the optimism of, of electricity, of apparatus theory, is that every apparatus is invented. It's not determined in advance. Uh, it's not necessarily one way or the other. Uh, it could go this way or it could go that way, but the ontology itself has to be actually created. So there's still all this room for, for invention. And if we get involved, if we take our part, uh, the humanity specifically takes its part, we have something to, to contribute. Uh, so I wanna talk about how I developed this research project. So I was in graduate school, <clears throat> 1967 to 1972, and I was in comparative literature, and I was writing my dissertation on the Rousseau tradition, and French was one of my languages, and so I came across, in 1970, in a bookstore, I came across De la Grammatologie by Jacques Derrida, and I looked at it, and sure enough, it's a big fat book, and it's got, you know, a lot of pages about Rousseau, and I bought it, and I thought it was a book about Rousseau, and I read it, and I didn't understand a word. Um, but I really got the idea of grammatology, and that kind of stuck with me uh, as as uh, the meaning, the history and theory of writing. So uh, 1972, I started at the University of Florida, ended up spending my whole career in Gainesville, retiring 2016. Anyway, I started in the humanities department as part of University College. It was kind of a general education program, and I taught a one-year course, me, me and a bunch of other people. It was on a quarter system then, so three quarters, and we, it was Western Civilization. Uh, it wasn't a great books course. It was kind of like Western Civilization from Homer to the present, covering philosophy, uh, the arts and music, literature, history. Um, it no longer exists. Uh, the college itself was dissolved, disbanded, and merged into the upper division colleges in 1980 and it was part of the whole it was one of the casualties of the whole post-colonial movement and there's good things about that but i guess uh, people didn't want kids to be eurocentric so now they're ignocentric <laughs> they don't know their own tradition or anybody else's but anyway um <laughs> but at least they're not eurocentric right no it's Raphael crap uh, so so I went into the English department in 1980. <clears throat> anyway, so I was teaching film and media studies. Um, and actually in the morning, so the, the story goes, so in the morning I was teaching freshman comp. Uh, you know, Aristotle, you know, still good, right? Been to 2,500 years ago, but you want to, if you want to write an argument, you know, Aristotle's your man. Uh, and in the afternoon I was teaching film courses, uh, you know, history of cinema, and then uh, once a week, I had a graduate seminar on the history of theory. <clears throat> and so bouncing around in my head, you know, as I'm moving around campus, um, was this question formed. And this is the idea, you're looking for a question, you know, this is the charge, as they call it. And the question was, who was the Aristotle of cinema? Because I'm thinking, all right, I got Aristotle 25 years ago, 100 years ago, generated this whole, you know, the rhetoric and logic and category system of literacy of alphabetic writing. Well, here, are, here we are with cinema, you know, film and then television, uh, and it's not the same, you know. So like, well, what, what's, what's going on here? 
Uh, and as you know, my motto that I formed actually comes from Basho, is not to follow in the footsteps of the masters, but to seek what they sought. And so the idea is we don't want to be like curators of Aristotle. We want to say, you know, good job, Aristotle. And, you know, it still works today if you want to write an argument, but we got to do what you did for our time. And that's how we uh, earn our positions at Research One Universities or any other university is figuring that out. <clears throat> so uh, what I was getting from the theory is, is apparatus theory. This is like apparatus theory. I recommend it to you. Um, and I got it from two sources. One, of course, was Derrida. And he was uh, in the 60s part of the Telkel School. Telkel is this journal was formed, existed in France from 1960 to 1982, very, very avant-garde, very theoretical. All the French post structuralists contributed to it, especially the early days, uh, Roland Barthes, Julia Kristeva, uh, Foucault, Deleuze, everybody uh, published in, in Telkel. Um, <clears throat> and the French word is dispositif for apparatus. Uh, and the other source of apparatus theory was from the Toronto School uh, and this is Marshall McLuhan, of course. I mean, Northrop Fry also part of that school. Um, but people like Walter Ong and Eric Havelock. And it was Walter Ong, and, and uh, I got this, he wrote this book called Orality and Literacy. And he covers this, what had been going on for a while. And this is grammatology. He was covering this transition from morality to literacy, which was from one apparatus to another, which we know quite a bit about, actually. Uh, that transformation. And then he was saying, well, the same thing is going on now. And he, he didn't know what to call it, uh, this electronic era he referred to, and he called it secondary orality. Now, I wasn't happy with that term, particularly eventually. I said, we need another, we need a term for that. And, and I generated the term electricity. Uh, and the question is, I get is, why, why electricity? And I get a lot of pushback on this. People are like, mm, I don't want to use another stupid Ulmer word or, or such. But uh, the term itself is this combination of electricity and trace. So electricity, obviously, this is the, the technological source of power that's driving our digital civilization. And then Derrida's trace stuck in there. Uh, you know, this is one of his keywords. Uh, he has, he's got all these terms that are more or less synonyms, but, you know, difference and so forth. But uh, trace is his replacement. This was in De La Grammatologie. Trace replaces sign. So, um, and the thing is, it's not digital literacy. And you know, people, even, you know, people I know very well and who know as much and more than I do, and they still use the term digital literacy. What digital literacy means at best is learning how to use Adobe, you know, apps to, to you know, to, to produce signifiers of some kind. Uh, you know, editing in Premiere or something. Uh, that's that's the best. At worst, it means using digital technologies as if they were books. Uh, that, that's what it means to me, at least. And, and, and what we want to get at is that an apparatus isn't just technology. It's all metaphysics, to use that term, to refer to the whole uh, understanding of how reality works. Uh, and it consists of three parts. And I'm just going, you're noticing I'm touching a lot of things that are in Internet Invention, but I want to frame them as part of this research program to let you know where these ideas uh, come from, that you can return to these sources and take new paths yourself. But an apparatus includes a technology of communication, so alphabetic writing, for example, uh, there's also an, a new institution is created in relationship to that technology. So uh, Plato founds the first school, the academy, about 387 before the Christian era or so. Uh, and then uh, within this new uh, configuration is, uh, is identity behaviors formed, a uh, new experience of 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 the individual and the collective. So selfhood is as much an invention of literacy as, as alphabetic writing is or a school and also the democratic state. <clears throat> and so then the question, the implication is electricity also is uh, a metaphysics and as technology is digital, the digital technologies. And then we have to ask, what's the institution? It's not school uh, and it's certainly, and it's not church, which is morality, 
uh, I'm suggesting it's the corporations, and specifically the entertainment corporation is the institution in which electricity is emerging. Uh, and I have argued elsewhere that um, that our Plato is Walt Disney, and uh, the theme park is our uh, academy, but you know, that go off in that direction. And also there's a new identity formation. So part of the thing that caused a lot of confusion in, in social media is people are putting their egos into social media, but that's, you know, uh, that's a misunderstanding because uh, online and in the dimension of the digital, we are not selves any more than we are souls. Uh, we are brands, and, and I'll be talking more about that. Uh, but one of the disturbing factors here is to say that 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 in this new metaphysics, this new account of reality, uh, everything ultimately changes, not all at once and not in some deterministic fashion, but um, electric subjects aren't going to be selves and we're not going to have democratic nation states as the dominant, as the hegemonic political system. So you say, well, what are we going to have? And of course, these things are, still remain to be invented. There are, they are being invented. Uh, and that's part of what we, we want to participate in. So the fundamental thing I'm saying here already coming out of Derrida's of grammatology is that my methodology is say, what am I in a disciplinary way? And I am a grammatologist, I would say. I mean, that's sort of, uh, and, and the way grammatology works is the history and theory of writing uh, is that we uh, understand how to invent an apparatus by analogy, sort of like, and partly this probably comes from the fact that I was in comparative literature as a methodology. And I noticed that Kate Hales is has recently, or for a while now, been talking about what she does as comparative media. So she's it's like taking comparative literature, but now we're saying comparative media. So as I say, we're generating electricity, or you know, the transition from literacy to electricity by analogy, which is, you know, a loose kind of configuration, by analogy with how, um, uh, you know, the transition from morality to literacy. Uh, so that methodologically, I'm going to be referring to that. Um, so my first serious book, actually didn't write it until after tenure, uh, which the nice thing about tenure is you didn't have to worry about if it got published or not. <laughs> uh, and this is kind of experimental. So I wrote this book called Applied Grammatology, published in 1985. Uh, and the subtitle is Post Pedagogy from Jacques Derrida to Joseph Boyce. Um, and what I want to emphasize here in, in talking about my books is uh, the role of theory in research. Now, a lot of people are saying we're in a post theory situation. Nobody like, eh, forget theory. University of Florida, we actually had a job and hired a person in critical theory this year tenure track system professor and we were the only job in critical theory in the entire country i mean that's that's scary it's very scary it's, but so but still whether or not you write your you don't want to write your dissertation in theory but you want to use theory i think in your research and i'll and i'll try to explain why that's so um but so um so what I was doing with Derrida, with the Derrida book, so I'm saying, all right, Derrida is my theory, and I'm in an English department after all. Yeah, I'm teaching film studies or, or whatever, but, you know, basically what English departments do and still do and everybody wants us to do, and that's why they hire a bunch of us, is to teach writing, writing of texts. Um, and so I'm reading Derrida, and he's doing this thing, and him and the Telkel people and all that, and they call it écriture writing the text, writing of text. So like they writing text, we're writing text. But when you read what these uh, French post-structural theorists mean by writing in text, it's completely different from what you know we we were doing. And uh, it's it's an expanded field. So like when Derrida talks about writing, he's not just talking about the Western tradition or alphabetic writing. He's, he wants us to take into account uh, all writing systems, ancient, Asian, Mayan glyphs, you know, musical notation, choreography, all these things. Um, and but he particularly formulates uh, this idea of what he called picto idiophonographic writing, which we recognize now as multimodal, multimedia uh, inscription, recording, documenting. Um, 
And he proposes a new linguistics coming out of our experimental arts. And he says our linguistics should not be symbolic logic, which tries to reduce meaning to univocal, symbolic, almost mathematical kind of registers, but just the opposite direction. James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, which basically Joyce, as you know, writes this mythological narrative in which he uses a kind of a hybrid of every language he knows, which is quite a few. Um, so, uh, so the question here that, that we're posing um, is uh, when I when I was asking myself in early days, who's the Aristotle of electricity? I'm going to propose that Derrida is the Aristotle of electricity, or he, he's a pretty good stand-in to to help us think about that. Um, and so I was saying to myself, all right, and I called it post pedagogy. The post again has got kind of a pun sept, it's kind of a Joycean pun in there. Uh, the French word for television is post, but also there's the after pedagogy. But I'm definitely interested in pedagogy. A lot of people told me, leave out the pedagogy, don't talk about that. It's a kiss of death to any book, you know, nobody wants to know anything about that. Um, that's always a good sign, like, people don't want to know about it maybe that's where you should go. Uh, and But I wanted to teach Equator to Text uh, in my English department. But so <clears throat> partly what the problem was, I had to say, well, what is it? And how do you do it? And one of the things you'll notice, you read a lot of these books, and I'm talking even like the greatest books written by all the philosophers that I'm citing, and they'll be 300 pages long, and at the end they'll say, we need a new logic. And they stop. And they, where is it? How, okay, you know. So I think where I come in is, all right, here's how you, here's how you do that. Here's how you generate this new logic. So the book is in two parts. First part, first half is about Derrida, and I describe his theory of writing text and then the second half is on relays, and I call it relay, but they're like models. You're not, they're not models in the sense of like do it exactly like this, but they kind of help you get where, where you need to go. And I was looking around for teaching, pedagogical uh, figures, uh, but that were working with, uh, I guess I'd say arts, picto idiophonographic kinds of, of devices to uh express and, and engage with the learning process uh so there I, there were three there's three that i describe in applied gametology first is jacques lacan his seminars in psychoanalysis post-structural psychoanalysis and his lecture style is like james joyce in fact you know the last couple of seminars that uh, the end of his career he actually gave seminars on james, james joyce but he kind of been or he, in a way he's talking like an analysant he's sort of talking from the position of dream work, you know, and it's it's very it's very lyrical, very poetic and pretty hard to understand, but deliberately so. So Jacques Lacan, the second example is Joseph Boyce, a German performance artist who gave these didactic presentations using all kinds of evocative, even shamanistic, um, uh, aesthetic, uh, symbolic techniques. Uh, so him, uh, and then the third one was Sergei Eisenstein, the Soviet uh, filmmaker of the 20s and 30s, who was one of the inventors of, of, of montage cinema. Uh, and what I liked about him is he had this project. He wasn't allowed to do it because he fell out with Stalin, but he was going to make a film, a film of Das Kapital, because Marx's philosophy, of course, is like the, the, the fundamental, he's like the Thomas Jefferson of, of the Soviet Revolution. And of course, a lot of, uh, of the comrades were not literate and they couldn't read Marx. So he was going to make a film of Marx so they could understand the philosophical foundations of their new uh, uh, society. So that was cool. And then there were a couple more examples that I had in mind subsequently. And I always thought I might want to do a second edition or sequel or something because i had more relays and one of them was uh, robert venturi and denise scott brown uh this book uh, learning from las vegas which 
So it's learning from Las Vegas. I love that. It was a, a Yale seminar uh, design studio taught at Yale in the late 1960s, um, published in 1972. It was really considered to be like one of the first, you know, works of postmodernism. Um, and, and so that was that was an interesting example uh, in a design field. And the other, another example is Paul Clay, you know, great, one of the great modernist artists. Uh, but he taught the, uh, the intro design course at the Bauhaus for, you know, 15 years or something. Um, and, and his pedagogical sketchbooks are just quite extraordinary. So you can see from those two examples that I'm starting to move in the direction of design. And I do, and I would say sort of loosely that design is to electricy what argumentation is to literacy. But, you know, thinking of design in a very uh, broad sense. And then recently, uh, a third example, and I really recommend this one, too, is Linda Berry. You know, and Linda Berry is a graphic novelist, uh, and she has this prize-winning graphic novel, which is fabulous, really a maestro, and it's called 100 Demons. Uh, it's great. And she also started teaching uh, drawing or art at the University of Wisconsin, um, and she's published several books about her method. One's called Syllabus. Um, Another one's called "What It Is," and the, these are these are pedagogies, uh, very very my very my historical. But they're working with drawing, and this is kind of where we need to go. I mean, this is uh, the end of his career. Derrida was talking about this too. Is like because remember what Graham? One of the that the meaning of Graham, uh, you know, going back uh, Greek and so on, is line, line. So, uh, so we need to go sort of beyond linguistics, not only beyond semiotics, but out of language into these other modes of registration and, and, and drawing is certainly uh, part of that. Uh, <clears throat> right, so anyway, so I got this idea, of, right, here's what pictoidiophonographic pedagogies might be in applied grammatology. And I set the work immediately uh, and what came to be the second book, Teletheory, and the subtitle is Grammatology in the Age of Video. And this was published in 1989. Uh, so I had Derrida as my, theory, as my theorist, and, uh, and I knew that I wanted creative arts for experiments as, 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 as relays. And what I was looking for was a genre, the new genre of this pedagogy that would be this electric uh, way to, to learn in media. And of course, at that time, the Internet didn't exist or it only existed in the background, uh, not in a user friendly way. Uh, so I was working with television, with video. Um, and <clears throat> what I was looking for, sort of by analogy, this is that comparative analogy. So Plato, when he invented, you know, his discourse on method, when he invented the academy to introduce illiterate people into writing, uh, he created a genre, the dialogue, and all learning was conducted in the dialogue, and it's still, it's still good today. So I was looking for a genre like that. Uh, and even this most recent book, Consult, I'm now calling it Consult. So, so my streak sort of evolves through several versions, um, several uh, supplements and, and additions. But, but I want to tell you about the research idea. Now, this is the thing, whether you work with grammatology or apparatus or any of that, here is the methodology that served me extremely well. It's very basic, and that is theorists are very generous. Not on purpose necessarily, but they write these books that are so rich with uh, potential ideas. They're kind of like these tinkers that go around in the old days that are carts full of pots and pans and whatever, peddlers and stuff, and stuff was falling off of it. And I kind of imagined myself was running along behind them and like, oh, look, this tin pot fell off of a tinker's cart. And, uh, hey, you know, come get your pot. But so... I, I started making soup in it or something. <clears throat> so this happened to me with uh, with teletheory. So I was reading Hayden White, uh, and uh, he is this fabulous his, you know, historian, rhetorician of history, uh, and his book called Meta History, still great. And he, he posed this question. He said, what if historiography had been invented in the 20th century rather than the 19th century. Now, in the 19th century, we still had the carryover of the Enlightenment, so the science of that day was positivism. Um, 
which is this idea that you can have, you know, full knowledge of, uh, of, of how reality really is. And, uh, and the narrative form, because history is a narrative, and so the, the model of narrative was the novel of the time was Balzac, let's say, a, a realist, realistic model of narrative. So he says that, and, and his history is invented, and it's like that, positivistic and, 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 and novelistic. But he said in the 20th century, our science completely transformed. Uh, and we got you know, uncertainty principles, complementarity, uh, indeterminacy, uh, and these kinds of, of crazinesses, which sort of made it, it broke off this, this direct connection with reality. And our, and our narrative forms completely exploded into surrealism and uh, Dadaism. Uh, theater of the absurd and so on. So he said there couldn't be such a thing. You know, a 20th century historiography, impossible, it's too unstable and so forth. And he moves on. This is great. This is double bonus. So he gives you this great idea. Like, whoa, what, what would that be? And then he says, you can't do it. That's where he, that's, that's where you go. See, you get that. Uh, something publishable maybe. But the, but the problem is you got to make good on it. So he's got, So what would it be? And I'm going to talk about the methodology for for generating these poetics of these new um, discourses. Uh, and what I was working with, sort of what I had in mind at the time when I was writing teletheory, I didn't have heuretics yet, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, there's this uh, uh, art historian named Michael Boxendahl, and he wrote this fabulous book called uh, Patterns of Intention. And he treated art history as a kind of uh, problem solution that's super literate right but that's okay so it's problems and solutions uh, and so the idea is that we get this charge and the charge this is sort of the language of law even or you know language of you know here's a, here's an assignment we get a charge and so we need the charges we need a genre for electorate education that's not the dialogue dialogue's great the essay is great for literacy. We need this new new genre, and then we and then we get a brief, and the brief is, all right. Here's how. Here's the materials I'm going to use to generate this alternative. Um, so we get this poetics, and so my brief that I put together, and this was completely flexible. Uh, but so I said, all right, I need a new kind of science. So I, I read Paul Feyerabend, uh, against method, who is this philosopher of of science is very much, you know, after, you know, Heisenberg and uh, quantum mechanics, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Roland Bart, uh, the fragments of a lover's discourse uh, for the theory, and then Ross McAway, uh, this uh, cr very creative uh, autobiographical documentary filmmaker, and he made this fabulous film called, very my historical film called uh, Sherman's March. And so I took those and I ins extracted instructions from them. So I read these things. And this is one of the rules. I call it heuretics now. But the rule of heuretics is you read for instructions. So when somebody says, you know, is describing, you know, how Plato wrote the dialogue or something like that, you can take that as a set of instructions to make another dialogue or to make something different from a dialogue. Um, but anyway, so... Out of so I extracted instructions from Fireab and Bart McAway, like meaning like how did they do that? And this is by the way the rule of reading that that all of the the contemporary philosophers are talking about recommend. And this is what text means is you don't worry about what James Joyce means. You don't worry about what Gertrude Stein means in Tender Buttons. She doesn't mean anything. What you're asking about is how do you make that? How do you make it? And so you look at these, like I've said, these three examples, extracted instructions of how they made it. And from that, I produced the first Maestri, uh, so-called, which is uh, Derrida at the Little Bighorn. It was published in uh, Teletheory. And of course, ultimately, Internet Invention is teaching the Maestri. Uh, but I want to mention, uh, so at that time, so this was the, the 80s when I was doing this, you know, from... Between 86 and, and 90, um, there was a, a grad student there at the time, Florida, named Christian Keithley. He made the first video, Maestri, called Clues. Uh, and he now teaches, he's a professor of, of film uh, at Middlebury 
college, and he still works with these ideas in, in filmmaking. Um, and then there was a, most of the maestros I taught, the, the students uh, made uh, uh, collage, uh, paper maestries, and, you know, we don't appreciate it anymore, but the photocopy machine was like fabulous. Like, what a fabulous, I didn't think we needed anything after that. Got the photocopy machine, you can stop. Uh, <laughs> cut, paste. But James Michael Jarrett, Mike Jarrett, he, he did his fabulous maestry. Um, <clears throat> And he ended up being a you know prof taught the Penn State system for a long time. So what else was going along at, at the period? So right after um, during this time, uh, I also uh, collaborated on a textbook that was called Textbook to get at using text in this idea of the French écriture, uh, which I did with my mentor from grad school, uh, Bob Scholes, who was uh, uh, did a lot of textbooks uh, among other other kinds of things, and him and and Nancy Comley also. So the three of us did a thing called textbook. It was a freshman composition book, um, and it's the precursor of internet invention, which is for upper division students. And and in that textbook, they went through three editions. Um, uh, there was a section on maestry, and in the first two sections, we actually published Jarrett's maestry. Um, so that, that was kind of cool. But that was, so I was already getting this idea of, and, and in fact, when I started teaching maestro, I taught it to, to freshmen. Um, so the major discovery though of the 80s, and this is this is explained in Internet Invention, but I want to I wanna hit on it again, it was Gerald Holton. Uh, and part of like going through these, dropping these names so far, this is like saying, like read these people. I mean, uh, I didn't just like sit down and, you know, drink some fortified water and then you know spew out strange words <clears throat> you know you, you read all this stuff do this research and <clears throat> so Gerald Holton historian of science <clears throat> and uh, you know this is a great idea this great insight of post pedagogy because what, what we're trying to say is like what's what's different about electricity um, as a, as a pedagogy, what can it do that uh, literacy couldn't do, uh, you know, and and what also Feyerabend had said and, and Holton agrees is that in the history of education, throughout all the history of education of literacy, um, it only taught uh, what we would call techne, it, it taught knowledge from the point of view of what was already formed into a discipline and verified. And what it didn't teach was how that knowledge was discovered. Um, so this idea of ordinary science where you do science like it's already been figured out. But what Holton was interested in was, well, where, where does original science come from? You know, where does like scientific revolutions come from? Like Thomas Kuhn's book on, on scientific revolutions. Um, and so the insight was, all right, there's three parts of science and we only teach two of them. The two that we do teach, we might say is, relating to the phenomenon, you know, the materials, the empirical matters of, of the science, we see the object of study. And then the analytical tools or the method of study uh, for translating those materials into knowledge, we teach those who are very good at that. But there's a third part. And that third part is the source of original hypotheses where these uh, really creative part of not just good rule following, but really, really innovation comes from. And uh, Holton called that uh, thematic, uh, the thematic dimension. And uh, it doesn't come from the discipline itself. It comes from the broader uh, life experience of the, uh, of the innovator um, and uh, really rooted in that person's disposition, that person's singularity. Um, and um, this was the the source, and so he, you know, he gave these stories, and and what he's basically saying is that the childhood of the innovator uh, is, of any learner is crucial, and it's like, well, yeah, I mean, the weird thing about human beings is everybody starts out as a child. <laughs> like we should maybe take that into account. You know, like Hitler was a child. 
one time. You know, Einstein was a kid. Um, and uh, so, so this um, this was the idea that that interested me. And what and what Feyerabend and, and, and Holton were saying is that uh, there was these two parts of of knowledge formation, the verification proof side, but also the discovery invention side, and that these ought to be merged. And um, the, and the idea was that in my proposal, you know, my brief was that like that's the charge. The charge is we have to merge the invention of knowledge and the proof of the knowledge. And my brief was all right. Here's here's how you do it. You know, with with the electrate apparatus. And we might say, what is it about the electrate apparatus that makes this a, a viable option for education? And the, and and this is a source of optimism. So. There's a, there's a sort of a, a, a stack lining up, matching the affordances of digital technology, you know, hypermedia platforms, imaging, linking, all the multi, multimodal stuff, one, creative logics. Like you go into any self-help section and say, you know, you want to have a great idea, you want to have a breakthrough idea, you want to have, you know, originate, so forth, uh, you know, use dream work, use lateral thinking. Use right brain stuff. That, this, this is right. I mean, I mean, this is the way discovery works. It doesn't work by symbolic logic or you know calculus. It's like whoop de. It's like you know it's James Joyce, it's avant garde. Um, and so those kind of logics. And then modernist art poetics. That's what I'm saying. So the, like Dadaism, whether it's completely bizarre, you know, bachelor machines, or the meeting of you know sewing machine and umbrella on an operating table is like what. I don't make any sense. Like Mr. Richard would say, you can't milk a cow with that. Um, and but Lev Manovich, you know, is this great <clears throat> contemporary uh, technology computer theorist. Uh, he wrote a book called The Language of New Media, and in that book he says, look, Dadaism and the avant-garde, in terms, has won completely uh, the cultural ground in the dimension of software. All of our software is dataistic, me, it's cut and paste, juxtaposition. Uh, but it hasn't yet gotten to the culture. So part of the project, part of the charge is we got to get the culture up to speed with where our, our technology affordances are. But there is this optimism that, uh, that electrate, uh, the, the electrate apparatus supports uh, an inventive uh, kind of, of thinking. Um, and to, to kind of sum up the lesson of, of tele-theory and, and really of post-pedagogy, it really comes from the motto of Nietzsche. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, thinking about what Holton said about, like, Einstein's childhood is just as important as his uh, PhD in physics and, and his breakthrough in relativity theory. And, you know, many people have, you know, there are many, many studies have been made of, you know, most of the great creative producers um, across all disciplines that confirm this insight. So the model comes from Nietzsche, and that is to find uh, the point where the aphorism of thought intersects with the anecdote of life. So aphorism of thought and the anecdote of life meet, uh, and that's what we're looking for. And um, that's what uh, the maestri is, uh, is the pedagogy for a genre to uh, find that point. Uh, and it's worth, it's worth noting um, in terms of your theoretical and your, and your research programs, we're, we're very familiar with the fact that the Germans, I mean, some people say, well, what's going on with theory and modernity? And we say, well, it's the French reading the Germans, reading the Greeks. <laughs> so there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, and in fact, you may have seen there's a meme where like uh, you got like a German philosopher is like, you know, writing the test. And then, you know, like the French philosopher, like, you know, or they're trying to copy his paper. Um, but so you got Freud and he found psychoanalysis. You have Marx and he found, you know, social uh, theory, economic theory. Uh, Nietzsche is uh, similarly... Uh, a founder of, I would say, pedagogy or, or post-pedagogy. I mean, when you look at the French post-structuralists, especially Foucault and Deleuze, 
they're Nietzscheans. I mean, you know, they all use all this stuff. They all use, you know, Marx, Freud, semiotics. But really, um, Nietzsche has this uh, foundational uh, status similar to Freud and Marx. And I think sometimes this is overlooked. But so if you look at a book like Deleuze's The Logic of Sense, which was published in 1969 in French and, and translated in 1990 in English, it, his point of departure is Nietzsche. And he quotes that very... Uh, uh, aphorism that I mentioned, uh, finding the intersection of the aphorism of thought and the anecdote of life, that's, that's what Deleuze calls the logic of sense and moves on later to the logic of sensation. Um, so, so, you know, I really, I'm just saying there's a lot of, a lot of force, a lot of very complex thought that's, that's involved there. Um, <clears throat> Nietzsche had this other wonderful aphorism, by the way, where he said, you know, life is the iron hand of necessity shaking the dice box of chance. And <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, give me something to think about. Uh, but so, and, and also to say, so when you are doing this uh, project this semester and you're, you're composing this, this image of wide scope, I mean, the advantage that that gives you uh, is that that's actually the laboratory that's testing the claims of like many hundreds of, of books of pretty, pretty serious thought, uh, you know, many, many, uh, experimental projects and so forth you're you know you're actually in the laboratory of that so you know when you start going back out and looking at the research resources that that um, support that you'll really know uh, what what people are talking about so we come to the 1990s and uh, and i'm fond of this because uh, professor mauer barry mauer was in gainesville in the 90 in the 90s and barry i don't know how much you remember any of that you know, uh, I, I still try and use it. Well, obviously, obviously, this is so. But um, so in the 90s, I was working on heretics. Uh, heretics is a logical invention. I, I didn't invent that word. Came across it. And, and it's one of these things. So because, you know, I'm trying to use theory to invent. Right. Um, and. Uh, and so I came across this definition of saying, well, heretics, there is a word for the logic of invention. It's in the OED, but it is obsolete. It's rare. Um, but there it is. So it's like paired with hermeneutics, which their library is full of books and hermeneutics, uh, which is use of theory to interpret. And I even had this weird case where I, I was giving a talk and the person introducing us had never met me, didn't know me, and came up before and said, you be published in the book. So there's a book called Heretics, The Logical Invention. She said, okay. Uh, and so, so when she announced me, she said, here's Elmer, he wrote a book called Hermeneutics, The Logical Invention. It's like, ah, you get no respect. Well, <laughs> but, uh, but so I taught this history of theory course, and I started teaching in 1977, actually, but I just taught it for years and years. Um, and Barry, you must have taken this course or some yeah. part of it. But, um, but so in this course, I had this great, you know, discovery that just happens from, you know, doing the same thing a million times. Um, and uh, this was the history of theory, of course. So it starts with, and I, I was interested in discourses on method. Um, and this is literacy is great for this. And, you know, Plato method is, is like the key to science, you know, producing knowledge in a, in a responsible way. And uh, Plato wrote the first discourse on method. It is the Phaedrus um, dialogue. Which we read in this class, too. That's right. That's right. And the, yeah, turns out the very first book I ever taught, the University of Florida in the humanities program, uh, first quarter, fall quarter of the humanities sequence was Plato's Republic. Now, at the end of my career, I wouldn't have dared to sign the Republic, you know, because the students would all rebelled and walked out because it's a big, fat book, you know, uh, because people are getting more electorate, you know, won't we'll sit still for the Republic. But but, but the Phaedrus is very, very manageable uh, <clears throat> still. Uh, but we read that. We read things like Augustine's Confessions, you know, Machiavelli's Prince, uh, 
Montaigne's essays and so on up through, you know, Breton's manifestos, or maybe Derrida's Difference or something. But in any case, uh, you know, as I was teaching, I discovered that all of these discourses on method where the person is trying to develop a sort of a new way to work, like Montaigne invents the essay or, you know, the prince is working with this genre called the mirror and so on, uh, is they use the generator. And the acronym of that generator is the CAT. It had five parts contrast. There's something they don't like to push away from that. A, the analogy, something they do like, it's kind of like that, it's kind of like something like that. It's not that, not just that, but something like that. You have a theory, which is already preceding them, <clears throat> that is kind of the rationale for what they're doing. And then a target where you know, this is where we need this, uh, this new method. And then they put it into a tail, like the tail of the CAT. So you a little pun there. Uh, they put it into some form in which they inventory these four resources uh, and they have to, you know, hold it together in some way in this tale, like, you know, Plato's dialogue was a tale. Um, and, uh, and in order to harvest the instructions. Uh, and so I use it as an analytical device and I really recommend it to you. I mean, and I've had other people use this uh, you know, and tell me it works. I mean, so any any work that you admire, filmmaker, you know, Truffaut, Godard, uh, for example. I mean, you, they have a cat. Uh, everybody's everybody's got a cat. You say, well, what's their cat? Uh, how is they? How is it generated? Um, uh, how's their work? You know, in in whatever form. Uh, so I recommend that. But after a little while, I realized, you know, a person could generate a new method of one's own uh, and, uh, you know, put in your own, you know, take the cat slots, put in your own, uh, you know, ingredients, you know, resources um, and, and, and generate. Um, so, uh, so I, I tried that out in the book Heretics. I introduced the cat, I introduced the method uh, in the beginning of the book. And, um, and then I put in my my cat, um, which you know, uh, I mean, the contrast was obviously you know the literate essay. Nothing wrong with the literate. The contrast is not like it's bad or stupid or evil. It's just like, all right, we can't do the literate essay uh, in online, um, and the analogy was method acting because we needed this kind of figurative memory. Uh, theory was Derrida, and and the target was you know online internet uh, pedagogy. Um, but but again, here's the generative idea of that book. So this is where the theory you know a little pot falls off. I mean, so so Derrida's got this huge peddler's wagon. He's going along, stuff's falling off all over the place, and uh, and this project that um, I read about was. Uh, he was invited. There was this thing called the Parc de la Villette. Um, it was a big collective project, uh, a park for creativity in Paris. It exists now. Um, and the, the sort of program was to invite architects, famous architects, star architects, to collaborate with a philosopher on the design of what they call folie. And if you've ever been in these, any, these big landscape gardens, there are these little folies, they call them, which are these little buildings of various kinds that, that create atmosphere and ambiance and, and all of that. And so uh, Jacques Derrida was teamed up with Peter Eisenman uh, to design one of these things. Um, and so Eisenman says, well, look, I'm the architect, so I got to, you know, design the, the actual plan and so forth. So you're the idea person, so you give us an idea and we'll build it. So Derrida is a little perverse here. Uh, so he goes back to Plato, who invented the idea. <laughs> it's like the forms, like eidos. You know, Plato took eidos, which simply meant shape, and promoted it into a philosophical term for idea to a, to describe this abstract seeing of theoria uh, that he was inventing conceptual thinking for literacy. Um, and uh, and that idea was that that Derrida proposed was from Plato's Timaeus, uh, Derrida's, uh, Plato's notion of Korah. And 
So the Greeks had three concepts of space. One was topos, and that's a local place. So the space occupied by an entity. They had also kenosis, which means the void, which they actually thought was impossible. They didn't think there could be a void, but they had a, a term for it. And then Korah was meant region. And um, Plato took the word Korah and promoted it again, like he did with Eidos, to uh, philosophical function. Um, and his question was, a metaphysical question was, how do being uh, and becoming get together? Because becoming is this changing material, uh, you know, world of uh, matter, and then being is what's real. These are, you know, the absolute universal permanent forms. And he didn't understand quite how they got together. How did being get into the world? Because he had a kind of a dualistic ontology. <clears throat> and this is actually still, this is the question of all philosophy. Philosophy never stopped asking this question. Uh, Deleuze is still, with his idea of the virtual and the actual, is still addressing that same question. But Plato proposed Korah. So Korah is an interface between being and becoming. And, um, and he says, now, Korah is not sensible. It's, it's not like a thing, not a substance. And it's not intelligible. It's, it's not a concept. But it's a third kind we call genos, which it gener is generative. It's a generative force. When I say it's a life force in a way. Um, and sometimes people call it natality. But um, so he said, and what happens in, in his dialogue of the Timaeus, which Derrida has written a very interesting essay about, is, is Plato says, all right, so I'm going to try to communicate to you and give you an understanding of Korah, but I have to use bastard reasoning. I'm going to have to use figurative, you know, metaphorical uh, kinds of, of reasoning. So what were Plato's metaphors for Cora? Um, and he had several, like there's, since this is genos, this is generator, he has, you know, a nurse, a midwife. Uh, but the main one was Cora is a kind of sieve or a filter. Um, and it is, it takes chaos, it takes, takes matter, which is, you know, formless and chaotic. And it sorts it out into the four elements of earth, air, fire, and water, which is the fundamental substances of reality. Um, and uh, and it has, so it has that, that sorting function. And his, his metaphor specifically was uh, the lichnon, which was this uh, basket, which was used in harvesting to to sort out the wheat from the chaff. Uh, and that basket was also uh, employed in the Eleusinian mysteries as a symbol of fertility. So very good for, for genos. Now, so I had an epiphany here. It was like, I could not believe it. So here was where the aphorism of thought intersected with uh, the anecdote of life, and this is why like, I am poorly, like I am a convert to grammatology, this is why, because I had this epiphany, because an absolutely terrific uh, instance of Plato's metaphor of Cora is a sand and gravel plant of my dad. Uh, the sand and gravel plant, I would truck down loads of gravel from the pit, you know, dump them into the hopper, and the belt would take it up to the screen, and the screen was a sieve and it sorted out the aggregate into three sizes of rock and one size of sand, the elements. It's like, I, and I hated the sand and gravel plant. I mean, you know, it was a great education for me. Uh, you know, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, like Cervantes got captured by the Moors and spent a lot of time in prison in Morocco and stuff. It was good for him. Uh, but I, I learned I didn't want to be an engineer, that's for sure. But there's kind of a destiny here. It's like, wow, you can't escape it. You know, it's like, oh, I think, like, maybe if I go to France, meet Derrida, and read a bunch of French philosophy, like, I'll be as far away from the sand and gravel plant in Mile City, Montana as it could possibly get. 
But no, it turns out like, uh, you know, this this my experience of working with this lignon of building materials was, you know, inevitably crashed me into Derrida's Cora. Um, but in any case, um, so the idea, though, that uh, the theoretical idea here is regardless of my epiphany, which, you know, I've milked uh, ever since. But but here's the thing. Here's the here's the inventive idea, though. It's this comparative system. So we're inventing electricity on a model of relayed through an analogy with how literacy was invented. And like I said, we know a lot about that. Um, so Aristotle creates the categories um, and topical logics and education all through the manuscript era, meaning from the academy in whatever, 387 BCE, through to the invention of the printing press in 1450, but even and beyond into Montaigne's essays and so forth, is based on topical logics. Um, so in the manuscript era, there were two things the students did. Um, they created commonplace books structured by topoi, to these topics, these places, for of the categories that were holding things that you could say on any subject. Uh, kind of a personal archive of sayings and uh, so forth, uh, and also operators like more and less and, and things. And the commonplace books. And then the other thing they had were memory palaces, because, because in those days, uh, of course, the way you presented your work was not by writing essays, but by orating, by giving sermons or speeches uh, and that kind of thing. So you had to, to memorize it, so you created, so you had these memory palaces by which were literally you had places that were actual places like your hometown, your, your very own house, uh, which you could use as a kind of a, a basic memory sequence that you would then place uh, very striking images that would help you then remember the the information. Um, so so here's the structure of literacy uh, in terms of how literacy as an operating system, literacy as a as a as a memory uh, system of by which uh, individuals uh, manage to store and retrieve. Uh, information. Are we still? Are we good? Are we still? Yeah, I'm just. I'm getting my uh, cord because my battery's going to run out here. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Because we got several more hours to go here. <laughs> <laughs> so fortified water. Yeah. This uh, juice is flowing. Yeah, I hear you. All right. Um. But so. So you think about it. So here, so here, here's how it's organized. So you have real, actual places, place. You know, you have archives of information. You have writing operations, and then you have the mind body uh, of the living memory of the person who's learning. Uh, now that situation uh, needs to be upgraded, reconfigured for new, the new apparatus, new tech technologies. Uh, so what I proposed was we need another notion of space and place to uh, organize this relationship among real places, the living memory, the archives of information, and the operating uh, systems of the technology. So I proposed that um, we replace topos with Cora, a different kind of, of space, as a way to, to think about uh, how to organize learning in digital technologies. Uh, so, and then of course you got to make good on on that. But heuretics, I, I then uh, generated uh, choreography, which was sort of an update of maestri, uh, using Cora as as a as a place, and also systematizing uh, the poetics uh, of creating this this genre for uh, electrate learning. So that's that's the methodology uh, again. You know, I did the same thing with Hayden White and and so on. So I'm I'm recommending it. Um, 
what else happened in 1990s? Uh, network writing environment opened at the University of Florida. IBM gave big bunches, a couple million dollars worth of technology to the university, and everybody thought uh, it was big servers. Everybody thought uh, it would go to the sciences, but we and we actually had a, the dean at the time of liberal arts and sciences was a chemist, but uh, he said, "Look, you can't just be scientists using computers if we're going to have you know computational." culture so you know so he gave this uh equipment to the english department it's like it was stunning i mean right before that happened like they wouldn't even let me have a buy a you know university wouldn't buy me a computer because like you're in the english department you get pencils and paper um and you know and then he said oh but how about work moving into a unix uh runs uh, you know server you know mainframe server classroom <laughs> well, okay uh, but well that was cool because uh when we so the english department moved in there in 1994 you know 1994 was when we got the graphical user interface mosaic came in and so forth and it made the internet really um really user-friendly very very practical could go mainstream pop culture uh and we taught textbooks so that textbook that i had created with skulls and comely in the 80s, we used in the 90s in our in our classroom, and I created a course called Hypermedia for Hyperdivision, and that's where I started teaching the Maestri online, and that course was the basis for internet invention, uh, which which codified that course. Uh, and in that course, in the early days, uh, you know, students were taught to create websites. They did their Maestri's and websites, and we learned HTML. And, and then CSS, we didn't work with JavaScript, but um, but of course blogs came in and blogs just sort of did everything that I've been teaching people to do individually. And so we just started using blogs um, and I used blogs for the rest of my teaching uh, online maestries. Um, the other thing that happened in that period was um, trying to, to push the research in the maestry and the choreography uh, further, and um, I formed a group called the Florida Research Ensemble. And again, I recommend this. Uh, it was pretty clear then, and maybe still be true today, is that when we're working in an electorate way, we need to collaborate. We need to work collaboratively. Uh, the Florida Research Ensemble was uh, a group of of colleagues from fine arts, uh, architecture, uh, and and people who had you know technology. Uh, you know, so creative photographer, uh, architecture, uh, architect design, um, computational technologies. And one of the things I recommend about such groups, though, is only have one theorist, never more than one theorist. So I was the theorist. If you have two theorists, all you do is fight, uh, you know, about the nature of reality. Uh, so one theorist. But uh, but the idea was that to be electrate <laughs> requires uh a skill set that crosses like the University of Florida is spread through three different disciplines. And I think one of the things in the program you have is that you're kind of bringing these things together. Uh, but, you know, you need to you need to have things from fine arts. You need to have things from computer science and, and of course, uh, from uh, liberal arts or humanities. Um, but so we formed the, the Florida Research Ensemble, and this is where we got into policy consulting. So this is kind of we're getting towards that issue of your confronting what to do about this consulting side of you know policy uh, disasters um, and this project that we did uh, was called it's called Miami Virtue it, it finally got published uh, online not until 2012 though but we started working on it in 1995 worked on it for five or six years um, and and so and the idea was an experiment to see if there could be a collective maestri, because what we were trying to form here is a pedagogy. So electorate pedagogy doesn't stop at the walls of school or it doesn't respect any of that siloing. It's holistic. Core is a, is a kind of holistic, uh, regional, um, cohesive uh, um, relationship, relational field. Um, and so it takes it tries to, to think about everything holistically, not, not, not analytically. Uh, so we we're moving out into the public sphere, wanting to, um, uh, first of all, think about consulting uh, 
by analogy, consulting is is a kind of collective pedagogy to begin with. So governments or corporations or you know in, in, different kinds of entities need advice, need knowledge, and they they will uh, the the whole the whole organization needs input, needs education, and so they'll contract with consultants, uh, teams, or groups or companies that 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 provide this kind of disciplinary knowledge. So we took that as sort of an analogy, sort of a relay, uh, conventional consulting into inventional consulting. Um, and, and so the idea was to have a collective maestri. And our model here, again, none of these things that come out of like, oh, I'll just think, do this, you know, but there's always a model of some kind serves as a relay. Like, could there be a collective maestri? Would that make any sense? And yeah. Uh, so we looked at um, improv theater Specifically, there's this group called the Wooster Group. Uh, I don't know if it still exists, but a uh, really, really um, interesting uh, experimental theater. And Spalding Gray, if you, any of you um, know his work, I mean, he's, he made the film Swimming to Cambodia, which got actually in the public realm. But he's a great, great storyteller. And he was a storyteller. So they used... Spalding Gray stories about his own life growing up in Rhode Island and so forth as the kind of anecdote of life. And then they generated the other parts of the of the cat uh, in improv. And so we took that as a model. Um, and we had this idea of a disaster. And the disaster starts with some news story uh, in the fourth estate, because what we're moving towards is the fifth estate. Uh, it's actually a, a movie, <laughs> which... Is about that it's sort of a little bit. I mean, it's about how social media uh, is the institutional dimension of, of fifth estate politics. Uh, but the fourth estate, you know, journalism, uh, all the news is fit fit to print. So what got in the news was um, uh, at, at this time in the, in the later 90s was uh, there was a spate of, of tourists in Florida being murdered. Uh, and there were some German tourists that were murdered in Miami, and they got a huge play because it was getting really bad press. And Florida makes a huge part of its income out of tourism, so it's like, man, we got to do something about that. And what we noticed in the news, sort of buried in the back pages, there, there was also stories about Haitian immigrants that had all drowned trying to go from Haiti to to Florida, and they drowned. Kind of like we're seeing a lot more stories about that kind of stuff, especially you know from Africa into into Europe now with migrants. Um, seeking more stable worlds. Um, and we noticed that everybody ignored, there was, just didn't care anything about this, these, these drowned Haitians, but there's a huge bunch of, of advertising. Actually, they mounted a huge, they didn't say, let's fix the problem. No, they said, let's, let's, let's create a bunch of propaganda to make people you know, forget about it. Uh, but in any case, we took that as our, as our problem. We identified the Miami River as the zone, as the Cora that we were going to consult on. And it's a good example because uh, of what we're trying to get at here in terms of, of how we're doing with this policy with consulting. Um, because uh, it's only five miles long. It's a, it's a secondary port in Miami. Some of you may know it. But um, it's it's got every policy problem in the world, you know, crime, poverty, drugs, immigration, you know, gentrification, uh, I mean, you name it. Um, and there are 34 public agencies assigned, <laughs> dividing up all these problems. Uh, and they spend buckets of money uh, and they keep changing directors and they try new things and they bring in consultants and everything like that. And they can't fix the problems. Problems just keep going. So, like, so the idea of the of the emergency uh, is like, all right, when you've tried all of your, you know, you've tried thoughts and prayers, you know, that's a reality, and then you try all these engineering and STEM and and sort of empirical uh, solutions, that's literacy, and the problems persist. Maybe it's time to take look for an alternative. You know, not against the other ones. You know, keep keep doing that. But let's try an alternative, a third way, uh, addressing the fact that um, electricity consults from a different position, that of the Egan, uh, with a completely, with a different um, 
metaphysics. Uh, and in fact, we know electricity, you know, begins as an apparatus in the Industrial Revolution. And the other thing that happens as part of the introduction of the Industrial Revolution is the Anthropocene begins uh, at that period as well. And some people date the Anthropocene from uh, the invention of the steam engine uh, in the late 18th century. And let's say more or less about the same time that Kant is writing his third critique, which is kind of the philosophical uh, point of departure of electricity theoretically. Um, but the idea is that that the Industrial Revolution, you know, produces this massive uh, intervention of humanity into uh, the nature of the planet. And so we'll say the new cause, uh, you know, each, like we say, each, each apparatus, each metaphysics has its own cause. This is its metaphysical position. What counts as real? Morality says God is the cause. And so the apparatus develops means and procedures to, to negotiate with God. Ritual, sacrifice, liturgies, prayers, and so on. Um, do as well as you can that way. Uh, literacy creates a, a new metaphysics based on nature that begins looking for the natural laws that are empirical causes. All right, so work with that as much as you can. Uh, but of course, where that led was to the Anthropocene. So now uh, we're in a position where we realize, wait a minute, there's a third cause, which is actually us, human beings. Uh, we, we are the cause. Our desires, um, our uh, appetites are uh, the prosthesis for these. Appetites is the corporation, uh, stores us uh, what, we, what we want. <clears throat> And um, but so this is the source of the idea of problems be us in, in the biggest sense is that uh, we are now causing climate change and uh, <clears throat> through our uh, great inventions and uh, all of our <clears throat> meeting all of our desires. Um, so uh, so this is the, <clears throat> the kind of uh, Point of view where we're where we're saying all right we what what the electricity what 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 emergency consulting does is to uh, help uh, in the public sphere create um, a discourse in which uh, citizens can come into an understanding of their own participation overcome their alienation the reification that has separated them from collectively from what's causing. Uh, their uh, world to be destroyed with, with hyper objects, you know, like climate change. Uh, and uh, not to celebrate it, but just to say, let's recognize what this new causal force is. And what we, when we look at these, look at an example is, uh, <clears throat> of something that one might consult on. Uh, let's take gun deaths. This is because the reason why, I mean, we, the emergency, the, the, the FRA has worked with any number of, of these uh, kinds of, of problems, uh, unsolvable, irremediable uh, disasters. Um, but one is really clear is uh, gun death um, because it's the, the value dimension is so, so clear. So, so a statistic, you just Google this and say, you know, how many people killed by guns in America? And so the statistic is from 1960 to 2011 in the United States, 1.4 million people were killed by guns. Now that's all means, that's like not only murders, but it's suicides and accidents and, and so forth. Um, 1.4 million and we can't stop it, as you know. Uh, I mean, in principle, you could stop it, uh, but it rests upon a value. Now, all of these irredeemable and irremediable disasters rest upon a value. And that value is a human uh, belief in, in reality. And, and of course, the nice thing about the gun thing is very clear is the Second Amendment, supposedly in our Constitution, interpreted as such, um, we could say, gives us a kind of a nine millimeter ontology 
but this is what we, we want to get at is that there's a value. So, so what we developed was this uh, practice called the memorial, uh, which is kind of an electric and, and actually became electronic monuments. Um, and the purpose of the memorial developed this new kind of monumentality to help people recognize that that these irremediable disasters were actually not private one at a time accidents, like 1.4 million accidents. <laughs> It'd be like four servicemen in in Afghanistan had an accident. Like you know, fifty eight thousand you know servicemen in Vietnam uh, had fifty eight thousand accidents and individually and got killed. You know, we're you know, so what? Uh, no, I mean we, you know, we recognize that um, you know soldiers fighting on behalf of the nation are die they sacrifice on behalf of a value. We may be a little cynical about that now, like freedom or something. But in any case, that, that that's the, the mythology of the civilization that holds us together as a nation. And so the idea of the memorial is to take these uh, other kind of sacrifices on behalf of these values, uh, like automobile deaths, you know, whatever, 38, 40,000 dead a year. That's a sacrifice on behalf of a value, and the value is I want to get in my Ford pickup at three in the morning and drive drunk to the, you know, to the Waffle House, and you know, whatever. And oops, you know, I killed somebody. That, that's freedom, though, you know. Um, and so, so the idea is not to celebrate that, but it's like to create. Um, uh, an intervention to create a monumentalization that helps people recognize that's the sacrifice on behalf of the value. And, and as I say, I got to that in electronic monuments. Electronic monuments was supposed to be part of internet invention. And internet invention got so long that uh, I just had to stop. Uh, I'm going to talk about the structure of that um, in a minute. But so so you're right to say, well, and I and I think I say at the conclusion of internet invention said, well, you know, we kind of like didn't um, kind of get to this far to where we really address the policy problem by means of our magic tool, but you know, um, you know, we had this. Uh, there's still a role for it, uh, even in the way the book is constructed now. So. Um, so let me say something about um, how the how internet invention is designed, uh, and um, how we can, you know, how the policy uh, dilemma, what is what its role is there, uh, at least in its truncated form. Um, so, so we said the challenge of, of post pedagogy, to say the charge is to merge heretics and hermeneutics, if you like, uh, discovery and and verification. Uh, because the pedagogical idea is, you know, what I got from Houghton is, you know, creative breakthroughs, you know, and this is our what our civilization really values and really depends upon is really innovative, creative thinking. You know, we sort of value it. Um, and maybe a lot of times for the wrong reasons uh, or we exploit it. Um, people are joking about South by Southwest in Austin recently, and it's something like the word innovation had been used like seven million times already in the first two days. Uh, you know, so it, again, it, it becomes a meme, but, um, but the idea is there's something very real here, and this is a, a pedagogical thing that I recommend to you if you ever try to teach maestro yourself, is that what I did for years in the University of Florida was say, look, you know, this is, this is what this is uh, gives you access to this experience of, of, of creativity, um, which can be drawn upon uh, and practiced uh, in your in your you know whatever your work condition is, um, and um, and so uh, so the maestro is this uh, is this pedagogy that allows you to get get in touch with this creative uh, force, this this image of wide scope as as Holton defined it, saying that the human imagination is structured around four or five uh, core images that then 
uh, format the imagination and, and guide all of your thinking in, in, in whatever the person does. So, so the reason why creativity has never been taught or is rarely ever taught in the era of literacy was because people said, well, before you can teach creativity, there's a sequence. First, you got to like master the discipline, you know, and then, and then produce some stuff. And then you can understand creativity, you know. So like in the old, so we'd say what Holton does is he waits till Einstein's career is over. And then he studies Einstein's, all of Einstein's, you know, work. And he discovers this image of wide scope. And actually, Einstein was very aware of it himself. I mean, Einstein in his autobiography told the story about the compass. And this is true. This is often true of very creative people. Like they're, they are somehow self-conscious of this image and they're able to to tap it um but so the solution for so the challenge the gambit if you like of uh, of post pedagogy uh, of the maestri is to say what if we could come into possession or come into self-awareness of our image of wide scope before we created anything you know at the beginning of our disciplinary career um and would that uh, give us uh, an advantage in our relationship to the problems, especially the original and uh, impasse kinds of problems of our contemporary world. I mean, that's like, okay, I mean, that's the question, right? Um, it's not a guarantee. But so my strategy for addressing that was to adopt the narrative form. And the narrative form, so we're going to go into the unknown, right? Like, we don't know uh what we're you know we don't have a clear object of study here we're really going to be trying to induce out of our own imaginations, uh this practice um so we're going to structure that as a narrative and the nice thing about a narrative in fact lev manovich has said you know like the general cultural interface today is not the essay as it was you know for most of the print era but rather, it's the Hollywood movie. And this is not just in the Western world. This is global. You know, so Korea has got a great cinema. I mean, Japan has a great cinema. China's, you know, like, so So this this form of the narrative film on the Hollywood model is, is pretty much universal. It's familiar. So we're going to use that narrative form. And in the Hollywood model, there's a three-act structure. Um, some, some people, you know, if you read books about screenwriting, they'll say maybe a five-act structure is better. But in any case, three acts. The first act, you're at home. You know, things are going along ordinarily. I like to use now sort of an allegory of the Wizard of Oz as a kind of uh, you know, figure, kind of an allegory about this pedagogical experience. You know, Dorothy's at home. She's having some, what do you call, fifth estate problems. They're like, they don't make the news, but like, this evil Miss Gulch is gonna like, you know, take her dog Toto and to the pound or something, you know. So Dorothy runs away. Uh, that's kind of a, a like a childhood memory you can imagine. Um, that's the family story. You start with that, you know, that memory. But in the narrative, there's a complicating incident that, you know, Dorothy's not a protagonist yet, but complicating incident is a disaster from the outside. Uh, a tornado, as we know, in Kansas, and this is a problem, uh, as you know, weather is more and more kind of disaster, uh, but disturbance in the force. Now, here's what the policy problem functions for us. is kind of like the tornado in The Wizard of Oz. I mean, so like there's, a, you, you decide there is something that bothers you, something that calls to you, and then the philosophers talk about this as care, really as Dasein, uh, meaning that something matters to you uh, of all of the things that are coming by especially in the news we get today and so on something strikes you um and the punctum you know uh, you're like the sting in which you recognize something there and the idea is that whatever that is let's work on that let's consult on that uh because that's already gives you an intuition of your disposition of your sort of your existential uh, positioning system. So Dorothy gets lifted up by this disaster, uh, you know, but all narratives have this type of a problem. Star Wars, think about whatever, any old, 
and she gets dropped down in this other world. And this other world is a liminal place that has its own kind of structuring principles. And let's say this is the place of building. This is where, and he is another one of Nietzsche's models, where you become what you are. This is where you're going to find out if you're the, the hero of your own story, as one of Dickens' characters said. And every narrative is structured by three tests. You know, and you read, you know, books about, you know, the wonder tale or structuralist narrative. I mean, three tests. Uh, and, and these three tests take the individual learner from the, the, from the condition of potential in which their capabilities are only uh, in, a, in a condition of potentiality, dunamis that Aristotle called steresis or uh, pri privation. Uh, and they become active in order to, uh, you know, overcome the, the obstacles and difficulties of this liminal world of disaster. Um, and so what's beautiful about the Wizard of Oz, as we know, it's like, let's say Dorothy is sort of psyche, like she's like your personhood, but she encounters these three characters, uh, as we know. And these three characters represent the three uh, intellectual virtues that Aristotle first defined. Uh, so the scarecrow needs a brain. This is Theoria uh, thinking. And the, the cowardly lion needs courage. He needs heart. He needs will, which we say is praxis. And then the Tin Woodman needs viscera, needs desire, say poesis, imagination. And these three figures are in a state of privation and they go through this, these, this adventure together, uh, addressing these obstacles and come into the possession, come into actualizing uh, the energeia of their, of their capabilities. And that's, that's theopraxesis. And that's what you're doing. And that's what any, any person is doing in their learning. Um, so the idea of, of internet invention is to, and I didn't use that allegory at the time. I have used it. I use it as a shorthand in workshops and things. But, uh, but so the assignments are designed to take these three tests um, and, uh, you know, in the narrative, the three tests are first you have to just establish your competency uh, to even be in the world. Uh, the second test is to come into possession of an object of value, which is the magic tool. And then the third test is the measure of your ability to apply the tool. Uh, and we get through the first two of those. Uh, but, but, but the exercises that you performed are, in a sense, the tests that uh, bring you into relationship with, uh, with theopraxesis, with these three virtues. And essentially what they do is they identify your existential positioning system. You know, we have GPS, which is your topos, your location in the world. But your core is this existential positioning system, which is not present, but rather uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, distributed through these other dimensions of experience, mythology, history, uh, as we know, uh, you know, the way in which our, you know, our theory of identity formation in modernity is called interpolation. Uh, from Althusser, this idea that that uh, we find our position in, in these ideological constructs into which we're born. As we don't get a, our identity is not uh, created beforehand, but rather it's constructed within different communities, uh, gender and identity, um, you know, race, nation, sexuality, and these kinds of ideological categories create positions for us in the world. <clears throat> and so we want to find out what those are. Uh, by using the pop cycle uh, stories. And uh, so, of course, what happens with Dorothy is uh, she does get her magic tool, which is... The magic tool, which is the red shoes, uh, you know, which turn out to have this kind of power. Um, and... Um, <clears throat> But, and, and so the, the challenge for finding the white image is to say, well, what are my red shoes? You know, what's 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 the the kind of icon that uh, they, that figures in some way um, my specific pattern that shows me 
of where I am, uh, you know, where I become what I what I am uh, in my uh, sense of identity, becoming into into possession of my capabilities. Um, and this is where we get to the question of assembly. Uh, how do we put together uh, these exercises that you've done? And I'm going to describe the exercises that, you know, the core exercises that I always assigned uh, to say how to transform your pop cycle uh, materials into the image and wide scope. Uh, and <clears throat> so the way the way it works is, uh, and of course, we're using the skill set of the humanities, which is um, specifically not just interpreting, but also you know, someone that comes out of the humanities should be able to tell a story, uh, should be able to, you know, construct a metaphor, uh, as well as uh, as an argument. These are um, these are what our uh, our discipline uh, is is master of, and that's our our skill set. So um, <clears throat> so the first um, so the idea is we've got. The family story, family memory, and I'll give, give an example um, of that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm thinking of uh, something I always taught was Maurice Sendak actually wrote a maestri, um, and he used the Wizard of Oz uh, as as his myth, as his, his inter entertainment story, because it had struck him very powerfully when, when he was a child. And still, I actually had some students that used the Wiz Wizard of Oz in their maestries even in in current times uh but i want to give this example because it shows what we're looking for so when you when you tell your entertainment story for example and and by the way the way what i would assign was the microfiction so you write you know very short you know flash fiction sudden fiction 300 words 400 words uh stories uh not to give an exhaustive history of your family memory situation or of the entertainment story that you remembered or the history of your community but to put into a description a scene that is the site of this punctum that's, that you remember, that you recognize. Uh, Maurice Sendak's example from The Wizard of Oz, so you got the whole film of The Wizard of Oz, there was one scene that stuck in his memory. Uh, it was the scene when, when Dorothy is, is sort of captive by uh, a wicked witch, and the wicked witch is threatening her and saying, you're never going to you know, see your home again. And there's a crystal ball, and in the crystal ball, uh, there is a scene from her home in Kansas, and she sees her auntie M. And uh, and Syndex says, in that scene, Dorothy is just aghast; she's never going to see Auntie M again. And her hand kind of goes up to her face and 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 shakes. And, and he describes that scene, and he says that in all of his children's stories that he wrote, he's the author of you know Where the Wild Things Are and many other children's books. Uh, he said he was trying to get that feeling tone of uh, separation anxiety that a child has in relation to, to parent uh, figures. Um, <clears throat> but so, uh, as we know, we're gonna use the, you know, the emblem form, but I always did a sort of at midterms, there was a warm up for the emblem form and we call it the felt. And, you know, the felt again, is this idea of the terminology playing off of literacy as text, you know, text is textile, the woven, you know, warp and woof uh, of, of a very precise logic, uh, and we're saying, okay, that's fine for literacy, but but electricity is more like felt uh, as a kind of texture which is done by folding, you know, with hair, which sort of makes this kind of mass, and then you press the mass, and then you cut a shape out of it uh, to, you know, create your product. Uh, and of course, the idea of feeling and affect, not not idea or or reason, is is the key here for electricity. So the felt form is just fundamentally a, a, a proportional analogy, which is called hypotyposis. Um, a is to B is C is to D, and I recommend the strategy, this, this design principle. So the students would take the family memory, you know, a story of the family memory. And they would juxtapose it with uh, an entertainment story. Sometimes, it, depending on the sequence I taught, they might use a history story. Uh, so, so it works with either one. But the principle is that the entertainment story, which is already a formed narrative, already a design narrative, uh, 
serves as a metaphor for the feeling tone of the family memory. Um, and so I'll give an example uh, by Stephanie, I won't use last names, but these are these are still online, but way. many, many maestries, my students compose are online. They're really, really interesting. Uh, but in her case was, her family memory was, she was a child that had been, her mother had put her into these uh, childhood beauty contests. So she's five or six years old and she's you know, in an evening gown, you know, parading around uh, in a pageant. So she wrote her family memory about that. And then she actually used a history story. So she's from South Florida. So she was kind of looking around in the history of Henry Flagler uh, and the Flagler's Railroad. And she came upon a story of uh, uh, that the, the workers that are building the railroad, they're, they're very near the beach in the Atlantic. And there's a beached whale shark. You know, the whale shark is the largest fish in the world. It's enormous. And, uh, and so it was quite a... A lot of talk about it and got in a newspaper, so a lot of curiosity about it. So they put the whale shark on a, on a flat car of a railroad and they ran it up and down a railroad, you know, many miles through in numerous towns and people would stand out and gawk at the whale shark. And so what Stephanie did was for her felt was she made a blend and this is the idea, you use a blend where you mix these two stories together to use figurative design to bring out the feeling tone. And so she had a, she photoshopped a figure of herself as like six years old in an evening gown standing on a railroad flat car. Uh, that's what it felt like for her. Uh, another example was Vanessa um, and her memory was uh again you know a little five or six seven uh she's invited to you know school friend not a not a close intimate friend but a school friend invites a bunch of girls to uh swim uh, to a to a party birthday party she doesn't know it's just a birthday party so she goes and there's been a little miscommunication uh and she comes in a party dress and it's a swim party so all the other girls are in swimsuits and are running around outside and so she goes in the living room and sits around in her party dress uh, that was the, the family memory. And the thing I want to point out about these is, is just notice these are nothing fancy here. I mean, I like stories like kid went to his grandparents' house and he'd never been there before. And, and you know, uh, grandmother says, here, take this mason jar and go outside and catch fireflies, you know. And that's it. Uh, it's just simple, right? But the point is that these stories, they don't cause the wide image, but they capture it in some way. Like they, like you remember them, meaning that they have in some way crystallized and instantiated uh, this this fundamental dispositional uh, orientation to the world. Uh, so Vanessa's, uh, myth, you know, myth or entertainment story was from, from this animated film called The Land Before Time. But these little dinosaurs and they fall into a tar pit and they almost die. They get drawn in this tar pit. And then she just told a scene from that. And then the blend is uh, she uh, tries to portray herself as the tar monster. And she's got this party dress that's got all this tar all over it. Uh, and it evokes this, this feeling. Um, so, so that's the idea as we start exploring this kind of feeling dimension. It's figurative. This is part of the skill set of the humanities that we're saying, especially in the lecture, is it's not logical reasoning. We're not trying to explain it. Like, say, what does that mean? She got tar in her dress, you know? Well, but the point is, she's not making it for you. She's making it for herself. This is a maestry. Now, it probably does communicate. I certainly, like, knock me out. Both those examples, I love them. Um, but it, you make it for yourself. You're communicating with your child self. You're trying to find this uh, this core experience, which is guiding, however, you know, unconsciously or whatever your existential positioning. So the emblem proper, and I had a very, ended up giving a very strict set of poetic guidelines for how to construct uh, the emblem. And, uh, and, and so the rules are, because the idea is, all right, we got to, we want to, we want to um, draw upon our, our full maestry. There's these three levels of the pop cycle that are stacked up you know family entertainment community history and so we're saying we're going to design an emblem now the emblem form as you know was then invented in the renaissance um by people who were, didn't understand how egyptian hieroglyphics works they thought they were sort of a hermetic 
kind of connection with reality. Uh, and, you know, we recognize that as sort of like Derrida's uh, idea of grammatology. Here's a writing, here's a writing glyph of some kind, uh, supposedly has mystical powers. Uh, and <clears throat> it had three parts, a motto, um, a picture, and an epigram. Uh, and of course, advertising took this up. So there are essays about, you know, uh, the advertising, uh, the basic structure of the advertisement is that of the old emblems of it going back to the Renaissance with the motto, picture, and uh, epigram. <clears throat> and but the structure is to say, all right, we're gonna we're gonna design this emblem. And part of the idea is we want to uh, we're saying that the that the experience of identity in lecture is not selfhood, it's not soul, it's brand. Right? You're putting your own image into this uh, fifth estate social media public world uh, and uh, and the idea is to switch out like if you're wearing you know you know death metal t-shirts or Budweiser beer t-shirts or even you know University of Florida teachers or whatever like fine okay but what about your own brand and the idea is that you want to design your emblem so that it will fit on a coffee mug or a t-shirt or a skateboard, whatever, uh, just in a sense, formally, uh, it's that, that kind of a, of a discourse um, to take over this advertising discourse, which is really the site of the invention of the electricity as a rhetoric has been in, in advertising in the context of the corporation and uh, the commodity form. Uh, <clears throat> but so you, got, so you got the motto and the idea is that you're going to pick one uh, Discourse you can use you can use it only once. Use the family story once, entertainment story once, history story once, uh, and you got to decide: Do I want this to be my motto, my picture, you know, or my epigram? And in any case, uh, the way you decide that is you're going to use the three stories to answer the three questions. As we said, uh, you, you, and you got to decide. And I would say. What I find is just try them all out, see which one works best. But these are the three questions. And I learned these, these questions were made explicit for me in studying uh, Japanese. I think this is in the book, but studying Japanese wabi-sabi. Uh, and the idea is that a, that a whole culture can, can have an image, wide, uh, an image of wide scope. And, and we can learn about how uh, an image becomes wide by you know, something like wabi-sabi, where you have this, the whole culture, this is a classic Japanese uh, culture um and and we say well what is this um you know wabi-sabi feeling this this aesthetic and um it's a, it's a particular it is a, it has a certain feeling tone um basho defined it as uh if you see a man all dressed up for a party uh, and that man is old uh, that's wabi-sabi uh, we think about these images um, that is like the cherry blossoms, uh, not at their peak, but when they're falling to the ground, that's why we saw a certain feeling of time passing, uh, uh, the streak of a rusty nail in a, in a weathered shingle, these kinds of worn, worn out, rustic is in fact a sort of a, a synonym, sort of an English translation for, um, for Wabi Sabi. And that's, the idea is that those kinds of of figures, those kinds of concrete objects uh, function in a poetic way to carry an enormous amount of of metaphysical power, uh, which is fueled or informed by Zen Buddhism in, in Japanese culture. So, so these are the three questions, and you should ask them in this order. Um, and the the first one is. Um, Metaphysics. These are these are the three M's, um, and the the first M is is metaphysics. So, what is the nature of reality? You know, how does reality work? And you decide which of my stories uh, answers that question. Now, in in Zen Buddhism, in the metaphysics of Wabi Sabi, uh, you know, the religious, you know, that that position is that things are evolving from or devolving towards nothing. That's how reality works. It's not how you want it to work. It's not how you wish it works. 
this is how you understand it, it works. Uh, the second question is morality. Uh, well, if the world works that way, how should I act? Praxis, you know, how should I behave? Um, and the Wabi Sabi answer is be rid of all things unnecessary, uh, focus on intrinsic work only. And then the third question is mood. So in that kind of reality, if I'm acting, if I have to act that way, uh, how should I feel? How do I feel about it? You know, what is what is my state of mind? And the wabi-sabi answer is uh, accept the inevitable, appreciate the cosmic order. Now, that's for a general culture. So you say for yourself, all right, what is my understanding of, of how reality works? You know, this is this is theoria. And I'll, I'll just give my own example. And this is where, you know, I'm going to be winding up here. So in my case, I kind of played around with all these, but basically uh, my my uh, my metaphysical uh, ant question was the uh, I used for the epigram. It came from my family story, um, which was um, the this piano recital. I had this memory of a piano recital, and I was playing. I love play marches, and this was in elementary school. Uh, I like to play marches. I played Gary Owen, which is the marching song of. Uh, the Seventh Cavalry, Custer's Cavalry, and so forth. And what I, what I had done when I generated that memory was I remember the sheet music, and I had red star, had a red star on it. You know, it's like not a gold star, not a silver star. Yeah, Greg, you know, red star. Okay, like yeah, you got through it. Um, so there was that. And so 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 I interpreted that as saying, as as the epigram was just to say. Um, Everything is competition. Everything is graded and judged. And I kind of had a sense of, uh, you know, all the things that, that you know, grades, uh, letterman's jacket, uh, degrees, awards that I've been pursuing were all these hoops that I was you know, made to, to jump through. And a big insight was like, whoa, wait, wait a minute. That's, that's what I've been doing. So that's my metaphysics. That's how reality works. Um, and then, um, so morality was, um, how should I behave? given that everything is a competition. And the lesson here was uh, from General Custer, the history story of my community, Custer County, Montana. Uh, and, and I wrote the motto for this was, uh, where are your reservations? And I was, you know, because Custer, obviously, <laughs> we understand now he was a fool. He was super ambitious. Uh, the reason he got so far out ahead and therefore got massacred from the rest of the forces was he, it was 1876, it was a presidential election. He was already kind of a superstar of his day, uh, a very popular public figure, and he wanted to run for president. So he thought, if I can just get one more big victory, this will take me in and win the election. Um, and so my motto was, where are your reservations? And I had this idea of, you know, Native American reservations, um, you know, Reservation holding a place for yourself for, you know, and also then moral qualms, uh, misgivings, you know, withholding, skepticism. Uh, so that was my idea of my morality. I took that from the Custer story. And then finally the picture, you know, what's my mood? Uh, and that came from High Noon, Gary Cooper in High Noon. Uh, and, you know, in that story, that film, is he sheriff? There's a gang coming to kill him. Uh, the town, he tries to form a posse, the town won't back him. He has to take them on on, on his own. Uh, and he does, of course, do that. A little bit, gets a little bit of help from his new wife, Grace Kelly. Uh, but at the end, after he's survived this, he takes the star, 10 star, this badge, and he throws it in the dirt at the end of the film. He's disgusted, and he, he leaves town. Uh, and that gesture of the 10 star uh, being thrown in the dirt was like the, the sort of the key gesture of my image of wide scope. I recognized it as as explaining my attitudes for like, yeah, okay, I'm doing all this stuff that the other of the the big other of our culture demands that I do as a man, but I don't like it. And so that my picture was the tin star, the badge, uh, to signify that, and. What I like about this, and this will be my, my last point, is what I like about 
uh, this figurative way of identifying the feeling tone is it's very precise. So there's many, many Western movies with many different actors and movie stars playing the role of sheriff. And like, uh, you know, John Wayne in Rio Bravo, that film was actually made to kind of counter and argue against High Noon, which offended John Wayne's, you know, sensibilities. Um, and so he's a sheriff in Rio Bravo. I'm saying, I'm not John Wayne in Rio Bravo. I am Gary Cooper in High Noon. It's very, it's very precise. Uh, so what I'm recommending to you is, uh, you know, I've been working on that. I've been reworking, working on that uh, for a long time. I continue to learn from it. I use it to guide me in, uh, in my research. Um, and, you know, but it's a, it's a pedagogical uh, resource that has this larger back backstory. What I wanted to communicate this evening with you uh, is that there's a research agenda here that doesn't uh, stop with my particular way of, of generating this poetics, uh, but it, it there's a charge here that says we need uh, an education for electricity, uh, and the brief is that you can either you know test my uh, ways of, of working, which is what you are doing this semester. Uh, use that as a, as a point of departure relay for your own inquiry, uh, leading to not only teaching, but research, publications, creative projects. So thanks. Uh, sorry, that was pretty extensive. Thanks for your patience. Uh, I don't know, we have time for questions or I, I sort of lost track of where we are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm, I know students are uh, interested in the practical as well as the theoretical. Um, and so I, I would say, look, you know, we can have students just ask questions of you uh, and maybe maybe it would mean moving. If, yep. if you want to come up and address this screen. Uh, um, but I do have one that's much practical. OK. <laughs> Which is, uh, Dr. Omer, you make a point with uh, the electric apparatus. Can you hear, Greg? Not very well, no. Okay. But yeah, why don't you come up? Why don't you come over here? Because I'm, okay. I'm sorry, it's just the way that. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, so I'm interested, Dr. Omer. So you made this statement about the electric apparatus as supporting inventive thinking. And I think we get that from working through the book. But I'm also. And I think that's a very optimistic way of looking at electricity. But I'm also curious on a pessimistic side, um, isn't it destructive as well? Isn't there, I mean, when we think about like the loss of data, and I'm, I'm thinking about this a lot in terms of archiving um, what has been lost within the electric age, isn't there a destructive side to electricity? Yes, absolutely there is. and and. Uh... You know, there's a very destructive side. Like one of the things that I would say we notice uh, in the larger metaphysical sense is that I'm saying that school is not electric. School is literate. And what we're working on is how to develop this transition from literacy into electricy, uh, which is this other kind of institution formation. Hopefully uh, there'll be a, a more a cooperative relationship uh, than there has been between religion and science, say, in the movement from morality to literacy, where these two metaphysics are just absolutely, it's not that they can't live together, they certainly do. I mean, Einstein certainly said he believed in God or whatever, but uh, but we see that these, that, that morality and literacy are at war and have been and still are today. Uh, well, similarly, the problem that we're having is when we say that the corporation is the institution formation of electricity, uh, Notice that the situation with the corporation, <clears throat> we have, you know, let's let's take our current president. And I want to get into politics here, but just trying to describe it in, a, in an objective way. He is an entertainer, a uh, businessman, and he's a science denier. And he's putting in charge of our institutions, people that uh, deny climate change. You know, I, when I collaborate with a colleague at MIT and I go there every year and talk with design students and stuff. And it's like, I'm saying MIT people like, hello, you know, you're in a situation where you think, hey, you know, yeah, humanities, nobody listens to them. But what about us STEM disciplines? Sorry, guys. We're in a situation where uh, you can you can do all your science. But we, you know, we're, we're in a, 
a condition where corporations have their own uh, conditions, which is to say, you know, they want to, you know, uh, make make money. That's what they're about. They're not about telling true and false. They're not about right and wrong. They're about attraction and repulsion, feeding the appetites of the civilization that's paying the way. So that's a very uh, problematic condition there. Um, and uh, and so it's kind of like, uh, you know, church and, and science, uh, science stopped believing in God, and now corporations have stopped believing in science. So that's a lot of problems there, uh, specifically. And also, as you said, there are uh, certainly destructions uh, in the dimension of, uh, like I mentioned, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't dare, I wouldn't dare assign uh, Plato's Republic because it's too long. Students won't read it, uh, and you know, so that's a certain loss. Um, but they do other things instead. I mean, this and but the imperative that the reason I'm optimistic and the imperative from our from you know the our best thinkers you know coming out of literacy and the people that are inventing electricity is to say we have no choice but to uh, you know to uh, create the practices of a civilization that makes it possible to thrive and have well-being against disaster in these conditions. The conditions aren't going to change. You know, we can't we can't change them. We can't unplug or whatever. We got to adapt and adjust and thrive in these new conditions. And that's going to mean some major invention. So my optimism is, one, these things are invented. They're not determined in advance. So it can go for better or it could go for ill. Uh, and the other thing is, like I said, I do see this correlation that I mentioned um, where creative logics are supported by uh, the inventions of our modern arts and by the affordances of our technologies. So, so however much, whether you want to talk about very, you know, sophisticated analyses of, of the most creative people like Gerald Holton did with Einstein or Kepler and others, or if you want to look at even pop culture stuff, self-help books and so forth, when they describe how creativity works, it works like electricity. I mean, it's like, it works like Dadaism, you know. Uh, you don't, but you don't do it in your head. You do it in the software. This is where Lev Mavish said, "Look, Dadaism was one of software, you know, uh, war, if you like. Um, it hasn't won the culture battle yet. Uh, so, so Dadaism is, is very practical in the context of of hypermedia and creative logics. Um, so that's I'm optimistic uh, in that sense that uh, there is a way forward." That uh, you know, it's very creative thinking, which I think you know we have to have. So I mean, one thing I believe in is education. Uh, I do think that education uh, is a, is a resource for you know the the civilization becoming uh, you know supporting well being in these new conditions. But yeah, it's you know maybe right, no guarantee. So do you? <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah. I think that reframes this idea of the apparatus for me. I guess I've always thought of the apparatus as being the repressive part. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's just a different. Cool. Yeah. Thank a lot you. To, a lot to think about. Yes. No, lots to think about. Thank you. So, who would like to ask it? Anything else? I was going to mention about um, JavaScript. <laughs> We're all laughing at JavaScript. <laughs> We're learning it. Uh, there are a couple of people in class who are very uh, fluent with it, but but the rest of us are learning it. So. Yeah, no, I think it's cool you're doing it, though. I mean, I all I, all I know is basic. So, like, I did teach HTML, HTML, and CSS. I never taught JavaScript, but I know there's a lot of like plugins and stuff. But whatever, as you know, if you Google this, the basic thing you see is like, so HTML is for your content, CSS is for your form. You know, there's consistency across a lot of of web pages or whatever. And then JavaScript is for interactivity. And of the kinds of interactivity that I've seen is like I don't really care about the inf getting information on people that are visiting my site and that kind of stuff. I mean, maybe there's something to that. But what interests me is this ability to have interactivity where there's like slideshows and things. So like if you think about what the what the wide image is really trying to 
to get at is like this gesture. Like for me, it's just throwing away, you know, of the star or like there was that shaking hand that, um, that Sindak talked about. But when, I, but when I look at the wide images of like designers, it's really clear here, Frank Geary, you know, Renzo Piano, these people, they have a very, they have a gesture. And, and in design, it's easy to see the gesture is like the party. It's like the idea that guides an entire design of like an enormous, you know, multi-million dollar building. But it has a, it has a gesture that makes it the work of Frank Geary. Uh, and, and I think JavaScript is something that you could use to like bring that out. And, you know, like you have this whole website, but it's like, whoop, you know, what's that? Oh, that's that's the gesture. I don't know how you do it, but <laughs> no, no, and 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 certainly it, not in this book so much, but in some of your other books, you write a lot about the the jest and justice and yes, yeah. and the sort of history and tradition of like say Commedia dell'art, and there there are all these paradigms and and. Uh, structures of gesturism, of gestural forms, and so forth. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And internet invention, you know, I didn't talk about software or formats at all because I said, look, you know, I don't know where things are going to be, um, you know, 10 years, 20 years from now, or however into the future. Uh, it doesn't matter because it's still going to be my street, you know, it's still going to be white image. I mean, when Aristotle invented his categories, like he had no idea what the technology was going to do, but we used his. We still use his topics today. We still use them, like in a completely, completely different metaphysics. Um, you know, it only had those topics only needed to be invented once. And it's good now. They're you know went through many variations, you know, expansions, and alterations, and so forth. But I think that the, the wide image is going to be good. It doesn't matter. It can be in virtual reality. You know, it can be, you know, whatever the technology as it, you know, evolves into the into the popular culture. So I just didn't even worry about that in the book. You know, you can do it in paper. You can do it in virtual reality. You can do it in, in JavaScript. Um, it's still good because what we're talking about is is the imagination, the theopraxis of, you know, of the subject. Yeah, Professor, I have a question. Um, you know, I had a question about uh, the values and the things. Yeah. So, Across this book, and then tonight we are talking about the memorialization. Um, it sounds like what you're after is well, what you're after for us is to make values visible, but values visible from our own perspectives. And that got me thinking about sort of positioning, ethical positioning. So, how do we evaluate if we're all assessing values or making them visible from our own unique perspectives? I feel right. like we're, the problem addressing is this problem sort of ethical relativism. You and I and everybody in this class and everybody who knows my story has their own perspective and they're making values visible for them from their position. It doesn't seem to me that there's any way to, to evaluate as a community better or worse outcomes or values or value positions. Yeah. Is that a problem? Yeah, no, I, I mean, this is a, you know, this is this dimension is very difficult to get at in a, in a utilitarian uh, positivistic, uh, instrumental uh, culture, society like we have, where we feel like, uh, you know, we value the STEM disciplines, which are, are indeed important, uh, you know, fix problems. Um, and uh, there's this other dimension that we're saying that is that is actually, uh, you know, structuring the world, which is this, this commitment to certain fundamental values. And I use that idea in terms of things like, um, you know, the kind of things that we that are called transcendental categories like freedom, the good, you know, like these things don't have any properties. That's kind of what Agamben is talking about when he's talking about the whatever being. Uh, he's talking about these transcendental categories uh, that can be embodied in many, many different ways. Um, and so how do we get at that? You know, the way our narratives do it, like any, like if you read any guys about how to write a screenplay, they will tell you that every narrative proves a, a, um, a proposition. It, pro it, it proves that a certain value is, is true. Like let's say true love. So Titanic, you know, and, and the screenwriter takes something like uh, that value is worthy, you know, uh, and then it proves it by telling you, 
this story. And you can find this value structuring. You can find a value structuring every narrative. Um, and so uh, what happens in electricity is we say, um, and, and that also, the, the, these values then are, are, as we said, are the, if you like, the, the, the rock upon which, you know, the shoals upon which the, the, the ships of, you know, of well-being all crash and, and sink. Uh, and, you know, people say, you know, a Sandy Hook, you know, the, the, the parents of the children murdered at Sandy Hook and they're harassed by people that say you're, you know, if either saying you're, that's a hoax or you're saying you're, you know, you're treading upon, you know, your child's death is nothing compared to the, to the value of, you know, my right to own a gun. Uh, it's a value, <laughs> meaning it's, it's, it's a fundamental, irrational, you know, commitment, uh, not just of an individual, but, uh, you know, of a, of, of a culture. So what we're trying to get at here is, um, is what is, you know, that there's this, like, again, with the Gamba, he's saying, well, you know, let's get beyond the, the sort of uh, crude categories of our ideologies, you know, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, you know, male, heterosexual, whatever. These are very, this is a very crude uh, set of positions. Um, and, you know, let's, and this is what our philosophers are saying, let's get to this more fundamental uh, ontology of uh, of life, you know, we'll just this we'll call it that this caunatus, the life force or something, which turns out to be, uh, you know, well being is a name for it. Uh, and the way electricity tries to get at it is to start promoting another dimension of value, which are aesthetic yeah. values. So the value of intensity of experience, uh, the value of of beauty as a you know coherent form. Uh, in a you know in a life situation, taking the virtues, the values that we admire in art, and introducing them into uh, life experience. You know, this is the idea of art entering the life. Um, every person an artist, jo Joseph Boyce said, uh, and that to, to add that dimension of value. Uh, so this is where people are starting to say happiness is a value, uh, and they're and actually the economists are finding ways to measure happiness and. And demonstrate that it's economically uh, important uh, that people thrive and economically succeed in conditions uh, of happiness over uh, the, the contrary to that. Um, and so then the idea is you develop behaviors that you know are invented. This is the thing to keep in mind. Behaviors are invented just as much as like selfhood is a behavior. It's invented, uh, and just as um, as much as the technology uh, or, the, or the institutional formations. Uh, so this is a challenge that, uh, that the memorial tries to get at, is to help people recognize that there's a value that is the reason why all the money they spend and all the new sociologists they talk to and firing people and hiring people, the reason why they can't fix the problem, the one that I worked on in electronic monuments is uh, the fact that a certain number of children are killed by their parents every year. So in the state of Florida now, it's up to about 450 children a year killed in the state of Florida by their parents. Every state has some proportional number. Uh, and these are from, you know, really dysfunctional conditions, you know, where, but, but the value is that, um, that families are, that children are wards of their family. Basically, the family owns a child. So you can come in, you can be, you know, I mean, there's family services and all this stuff, but basically you give the kid and it's against the law to kill him. But, you know, if you're, you know, so, but the kid goes home and gets killed. Uh, you can't stop that. Believe me, they have spent many millions of dollars and, and brought in many, many people and so forth. And it's like 450 a year. Uh, and you, and the, to stop it, you'd have to change the way the value, you'd have to change the family structure. We're not going to do that. So that's why I say it's a sacrifice that should be recognized. Uh, it's not just an accident. And so th this is a challenge to recognize what things are structural and what things are, are superficial. Uh, and we try to go to the core of the value. So like when, so what I think what's different about electricity as a policy consultancy, let's take something like uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, white cops killing uh, black guys and nothing comes of it. That's the symptom. That's not the cause, right? 
that's just on the surface. We try to get at is let's let's go, you know, let's go out into a field. Four is like a field concept, you know, and you look at the larger system of relationships within which that happens to identify the value upon which that condition exists. That's what we have to um, address in electricity, and we call it attraction repulsion. Um, people are attracted to things and repulsed by things. And it's not rational, and you can't talk them out of it. Um, so, and this is where Egan comes in. And one of the things I want to say, Baudrillard called it, you know, um, fatal strategy. Uh, maybe there are some things that can't be fixed. This is what Agamben is saying. Um, it's not fixable. Now what? You know, I mean, maybe it is, but it's certainly not ut utopian. But it's a big, yeah, so... So the idea is make people aware of the value, and then we'll see. Because values have been flipped historically. Usury used to be a terrible sin. Now everybody wants to become a usurer. They go to Princeton and get into finance and make start out at you know three hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, usury used to be bad. Uh, curiosity used to be bad. It was called sadia, and you know monks got eaten for it. But now it's a good thing. Yeah, well, maybe we should let it go. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have been very patient. I sure appreciate it. And, uh, you know, like if you put some of this stuff online or whatever, I'd, I definitely will want to take a look at it. Yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, if uh, if we have some questions coming out of this, are you uh, maybe we can contact you by email or something? Uh, follow up. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Cool. Putting you on the spot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what? What's Thank email? You. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Good night. Good night.